I find in my design career, there are no more engaging projects than the ones that have a direct impact. And this company that we're talking to today, Conservify, is doing just that. They're building things that are going out and helping citizen scientists, helping research scientists, and monitoring the environment to go and help save the world. Throughout this conversation, we'll talk about things like modular design, which is an interesting technical concept that then is applied to a manufacturing and a design capability. At the end of the day, they're building something called Field Kit, which is in pre-order now, should be available soon. So if you know of any scientists who are looking to monitor the environment, if you're a scientist or you're looking to monitor the environment, I think this is a really great fit for you. And uh, I'm really excited for the things that Conservify has been doing in the past with their past projects and this new one coming up. So I hope you enjoy this interview with the Conservify engineering team, talking about the field kit and talking about saving the world. All right, we're here with the Conservify field team, and we're going to be talking about the field kit today. And so welcome, guys. Can you tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Yeah, sure. I'll start and then I'll pass it on to uh, Jacob and Bradley. Um, so my name's Shaw Selby. I am an, uh, an engineer, um, but I usually call myself a conservation technologist. And what that sort of means um, in relation to the work that we do is we try and develop technology, technologies to help with issues around wildlife conservation, environmental protection, um, anything in that sort of uh, realm. And so con being a conservation technologist is kind of a new thing. Um, and so what, what we try and do, I, I started an organization um, called Conservify, whose mission is to uh, partner with institutions that are out in the field. And that could be like an, a, a nonprofit or a university or a community um, that's doing some sort of conservation work and they need a technology solution for it. And so Conservify as a nonprofit would help them design that technology solution and test it and build it and everything and then deploy it out into the field. Um, and so that's something that, you know, uh, we'd been doing for a couple of years and um, that took us to projects on, you know, glaciers in Banff National Park, in, in the Amazon rainforest. We've worked in um, all over Sub-Saharan Africa and, and the Congo Basin within Africa, so rainforests within Africa, lots of different projects all over. It's been um, quite exciting. And and the work uh, traditionally will kind of run a full gamut of the sort of stuff that we've worked on developing before. We've, we've worked on like smartphone apps, uh, drone programs. Um, but it, the majority of a lot of the stuff that we had been doing was focused around sensors um, and you know, that's kind of what led to the field kit project um, that we'll talk about mostly today. So um, I'll save the history for that, but we'll go through and introduce the two other team members that are uh, here today. Great, great. And Jacob, how about you my go name, next? Hi. Yeah, yeah, my name's Jacob Llewellyn. I'm a principal engineer at uh, Conservify and um, and principal engineer on the field kit project. And my goal is uh, just what it says right there. I, I basically juggle a lot. Um, until we brought on Bradley, who will introduce himself shortly, uh, I was helping out. I was doing the hardware mostly, but now, thankfully, my uh, my job is software mostly. Yeah. I was going to say sometimes sometimes you really you really go to great heights for the for the company. It seems like <laughs> that uh, I think is probably one of my most favorite experiences so far. Uh, that picture. Um, and so people just listening, this is Jacob up in a tr tree. I mean, I can't tell. I mean, it looks like what, 20, 30 meters off the ground, maybe more. Yeah, 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 yeah about that. Yeah. So. Um, uh, very safe, as you can see. I was in very good hands. I was there with a, a, a friend of the company, Peter Houlihan, uh, who's a great guy. Um, and, uh, and this particular thing is us installing uh, lorry gateways up in the trees in the, in the oh, job wow. reserve in Cameroon. Um, but yeah, Jake Lone, engineer, head nerd, um, head field nerd, I like to say sometimes. <laughs> yeah, and you know, I I'll just quickly uh, say that 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 picture is a perfect example of the kind of work that we do at our company. So you know, Conservify has this this uh, engineering lab in Los Angeles, and then and also a lab in in Connecticut. But but that lab is full of things that you would use to build electronics. So you know, like and three D printers and all that sort of stuff. But we also have kayaks and ice axes and you know tree climbing gear and all sorts of stuff like that so it's it's kind of a cool place but let's uh, talk to bradley um as well i'm bradley gothrop i'm a hardware designer 
which is a, a term I use to keep from being uh, berated by proper credentialed engineers. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm the guy who spends his time mostly in, uh, in Eagle and at the uh, electronics bench, trying to make sure uh, all the hardware behaves and trying to keep as much of it as possible off of, uh, off of Jacob so that he can be code monkey all day, which is where he is happiest. Right, right. In the trees or in the code, one of the two, right? Yeah. <laughs> I think the trees are preferable, but I don't think it quite works out that he could do that as much as he would like. Right, yeah. Not a, yeah, not a lot I, of power it's, it's, up in trees. That's right. Well, yeah, you got a solar panel, but, you know, if the sun's not shining, you're in trouble. I think, so one of the things I'm really excited to talk to you guys about is just like, so we the company's called Contextual Electronics here, and we talk about how to actually get, you know, why are electronics out in the world in the first place? I just feel like this is such a great example of it. It's it's helping monitor the environment, helping monitor animal populations out, out in remote areas. And it just seems like such a great application of electronics. One thing that is difficult, and maybe you guys can speak to up front here, is just the electronics are delicate. And <laughs> this does not look like a super friendly environment for electronics. So, so how does that all work out? Jacob definitely has lots of thoughts about that. But I, I, you know, I think largely we're putting electronics in, in the worst possible environments you can imagine to put them, right? Rainforest. The first project that we really tried to do on a big scale was in a wetland. Um, and so, and, and, and like, so you have to ex think about all the environmental stuff that you have to pay attention to when you're doing that sort of stuff. But um, just before we get into that specifically, I'll say one of the cool things about the work that we do is um, in the conservation space and and kind of the environmental space, technology is usually seen as something that was always a little bit of an afterthought or like if people are using technology in the field, they're either doing one of two things. One, they just happened on something that was used before and they're, now they're using it for conservation purposes or um, two being, you know, they're buying it from maybe the one company that builds that sort of thing or, the, the you know, there's a couple options out there. And those, those companies that are building sensors and other sorts of technologies in this environmental space tend to be a little bit older and kind of slow moving. Um, and so one of the things that we've been really trying to think about is like, how do we leverage like just the insane amount of innovation we've seen in the electronic space over the last like, you know, 10 to 15 years and reimagine some of these, these same systems, but like in an open source uh, capacity. And so I think yeah. that's the first thing is, is like using these tools in the field, like we're bringing in uh, maybe similar tools that people have used before, but like trying to restructure them and uh, use an architect architecture that's much more modern and, and open source. And so that's kind of a, yeah. a new new thing. Yeah, kind of like how a lot of like modern consumer space companies are using off the shelf components that are obviously they, they go and they characterize them and they make sure they're going to be designed in a safe environment and, and usable up there, but, but still putting, putting the mass market available electronic components out in the world. It's not some super specialized thing. You're not making conservify branded resistors because you need to have that super spec. You're using all the things that are available, but then they go into these very, um, should we say wet environments? I mean, uh, is this, is that a fair yeah. thing to say as, as we see another, another, uh, another glamour shot of Jacob hanging over the side of a boat and soldering is that soldering there That's, yeah. Uh, yeah 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 i have a butane a butane soldering iron that i'm using uh right there and that was my first encounter with leeches actually and uh <laughs> speaking but not your last uh, uh, <laughs> I, I they are my the health benefits my favorite. are just off the chart <laughs> yeah <laughs> um you know i will say that you know we i think people that are in the hardware doing hardware work are used to sort of designing for the, their customers and their, their people. Um, and we definitely have a very, there's a lot of that we have to do because many of our customers are very, are, and our your users are very unique in that they're unique for the, the goals they have with the hardware and where they're at, but also there are, there's nature. And that's another thing that um, is something we think a lot about, like when it comes to like cabling and UV and batteries and temperature and all that kind of stuff and anticipating what people want to do with the hardware is, is, is a little more than what you might have to do anticipating what they're going to do with like a consumer product that has to see, you know, just a commute and time at home and time at the office. Um, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a lot of, it's a lot of thinking about things that you're not used to thinking about. And so field work is, is very important as a, is creating that feedback loop about, you know, okay, what needs, what worked this time around and what didn't. Um, I'll let others. 
say, when I started with uh, FieldKit, one of my early commitments to Jacob was to produce a hardware platform that would not require him to lean off of the side of a boat with a soldering iron ever again. That's a good. That's a good. That's a good opening offer. You know, yeah, that's a, it's a goal of, uh, yeah, of mine. Yeah. And, and the other one was that, kind of speaking to what Shaw was talking about earlier, that we would try and position the platform in a place where the hoses of money that are uh, being spent by large corporations are hitting us right in the face. Mm. Um, where where you can really take advantage of the things that other people are spending their R and D dollars on. Mm. Um, yeah, so you is, mean using like off the shelf chips and the yeah, just I mean the the explosion of of available components from smartphones and similar yeah you you, you want to be where other people's research dollars are uh, yeah, are strongly in evidence, mm -hmm. and that's that's the sweet spot for uh, for small players in general and anyone who's it's an overused word but anyone who's doing disruption right mm -hmm. because the reason why that stuff is cheap isn't you know any kind of natural law it's because the parts that we're using are being used elsewhere in the industry in million counts and so that's that's the leverage that small players have in the business against established players who've been in the business so long that they have no incentive in an area with that little competition to push prices down. Mm -hmm. um, they know that people will pay what the going rate is. That's right. Yeah. So they're just going to keep doing that until it doesn't work anymore. That's right. I, I would also add before we get off the weird requirements thing is um, we have things that we always run into with our projects. So, you know, do you have reliable power will always be answered as no. Um, and like, you know, can I talk to the device? Like, from my home, like, do we have communication? That's probably not, right? And so we have to think a lot about how we design things that work within that context. Now, we do have like some situations where we can leverage things like LoRa and stuff like that, but still it's always like, you know, we're designing something that needs to go out into an extreme environment and work for a really long time. And like those extreme environments, like I, I you know, I remember leading up to our current Amazon project in one area, they, they wanted to monitor water level and, um, you know, our partner in, in that deployment is um, uh, the Tropical Rivers Lab at Florida International University. And I, I remember talking to them, I was like, okay, well, water level, that, that sounds good. And, and we'll do water quality in that area too. But so you, you said that there's quite a difference between the dry season and the wet season when the floods come down. What's that difference? And he said in the place where they wanted to deploy these sensors, that difference is 50 meters of water level change. And, wow. and you know, when it's at its highest, like you're not worried about, you know, leaves as the plant debris going down. You're worried about 20 meter trees as debris that's traveling through this, yeah. this thing. Wow. And that will, I mean, you can't, you know, we, we used to, we did a lot of work in Botswana and like people would always ask us like, okay, your sensors, what happens if an elephant wants to attack your sensor? And, you know, I would just say you would have a flat sensor. There's like not anything we could do. <laughs> Ele to elephant protect wins. Against that, you know, yeah. yeah, they would, they would win. Yeah, that I'm on. I'm on the 12th floor right now of the building. And so, yeah, 15, or would you say it was 150 meters? Fif or no, 50, 50, 50 meters. 50 meters. 50 yeah, meters, yeah. which is like 150 yeah. feet, right? So, or yeah. roughly. And so, yeah, that'd be, that'd be up above my 12th floor. Yeah, I mean, the Amazon, <laughs> that, that, that basin moves more water than any other place in the world, right? So that's just a uh, massive amount of water coming through it. And and it's hard so Jacob was up that. really high in a tree when he was installing that one. <laughs> yeah. Thankfully, that was uh, that was in Africa. It wasn't in the the Amazon basin. But um, got it, got it. Still a very wet place. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so we have we have, I think, sufficiently set the stage for uh, this is a rough environment. It sounds like, uh, and so there's a lot of interesting things around that. But and you, you've also kind of like alluded to the fact that there's. Uh, it's a rough environment for the scientists who are maybe trying to implement these things. But what is the historical, like, what do people use otherwise, right? So like before Conservify was around, before Fueled Kit, a scientist maybe 20, 30 years ago wants to go and measure water, water quality level or measure light output or, you know, something in the field. What do they do? And then, and then let, let's lead that into what is in the Fueled Kit now. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, that's a good question. There's a, there's a couple of ways to do it. Um, one, one thing, and this is something we're trying to solve with field kit is right now, the way science is done in the natural world, um, that science 
only happens when there's that scientist out there doing the actual work, right? So like the person will spend a couple of weeks in the field gathering a bunch of data. When they leave and they go back to their home, that data stops. Like you don't have a way to continue to gather data right now. Uh. The, the way you would do that now, or, you know, in years leading up to this, like is you would, you would buy a system that's like built for that sort of thing. And, you know, there's a number of big companies that make these environmental monitoring systems that, you know, appeal to these uh, ecology and field science um, studies, but there's a lot of like inherent flaws in them. One is, you know, if you were to take this hardware and open it up, uh, it's, it's old technology, right? It's, I mean, sure. it's really, really old stuff. And um, one, when we've heard the same sort of criticisms from every scientist we've worked with, one, it's way too expensive. And so like, this sure. is like, when I say way too expensive, I'm saying, you know, they're, they're charging six grand for something that's probably about, you know, 200 bucks worth of parts, right? So it's not, yeah. I mean, granted, there's engineering work and stuff, but like, this is probably something that they designed in the early 90s, right? Um, the, okay, so the, a, scientist, a scientist gets a chunk of research dollars, it sounds like. Yeah. They go to this established company, they buy this expensive thing paid for by that chunk of research dollars, and then they yeah. literally fly to the place and yeah. camp next to it. Is that kind of the idea? And they stay yeah. there for some chunk of time? Yeah, yeah, yeah and they stay there. But, but the thing, too, is like these tools are so expensive that only a few scientists can do that, right? Like you can have mm. scientists from, from universities in the U.S. or U.K. Mm. be able to do that. But if you try and right. talk to a scientist like, from you know, university in Lima, Peru or something, they just, there's no chance they'll ever get access to that tool, right? Got it, yep. Yeah, I, and I've been, uh, especially the early, when we started this earlier, uh, I've been on expedition where there's glass vials and you're wow. drawing water into glass vials and you're going back and you're taking them with you back to the university or, or mm -hmm. wherever. And that's an even, mm -hmm. even bigger example of what Shaw was talking about earlier, where, you know, the scientists have to be on site to be getting data. Um, and I think it was one of the first things that, Shaw sort of pointed out when we when he got the idea for field kit uh, was like, hey, this is something that can be automated, and um, and what so being automated. Do you, do you mean that they were like like writing stuff. writing in a notebook? Is that like what you mean? Oh, yeah. now? like they're sitting there, like just they're like, oh, look, the water level has changed. Right, 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 right. right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, or yeah. like they, you know they have a file and they write a, they write the location number on it, uh, oh, okay. time or whatever, and they have a box where the sort of squiggly yeah. uh you know analog oh, yeah. data loggers of your right. you're used to seeing associated with seismographs and movies yeah those those are real yeah. things mm -hmm. yeah. yeah 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 they used yeah. to have those uh in the stuff i did it was be like uh in like power plants they would have like pressure meters and similar things and it was uh, charting a charting kind of thing barometer or similar it's crazy right. yeah 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 i mean it's it's and, and this is something that happened up until very recently it's still it still happens in many places the the project that um inspired field kit was um it took place in the okavango delta in botswana and the whole premise when we first there it was it was me and this individual uh, named jer thorpe who's also part of field kit um and so we came into this expedition team that was doing this transect across the the okavango delta the wetlands and they're gathering all this data but what they were gathering was like you know writing it in notebooks and then they would come back and they'd spend weeks trying to like, tr you know, transcribe those notebooks to Excel spreadsheets. And then those spreadsheets would kind of live in these places. And, and Jer and I had, you know, had this conversation where we we're just like, this is bonkers. Like you have these scientists that are going to literally the most pristine environments in the world. Like they're, they're looking at just these places that in, are entirely wild in, incredibly amazing gathering all this data and that data just goes and sits on a hard drive or or more likely in a filing cabinet somewhere and nobody ever gets access to it so like how do we create the tools that allows this information to come out like while the expedition is going on while the scientist is out in the field and that was that what that idea is what sparked field kit um to be created great yeah and so it's worth pointing out too that when the hardware is really expensive, which a lot of the stuff on the market is, that has effects on what people plan as their expeditions, right? Like mm. if you have thirty grand in <clears throat> essentially glorified data loggers, you're not going to put them in elephant territory and wait for them to get flattened. Um, you're not going to stick them in situations which might potentially be dangerous, and you're certainly not going to leave them there when you fly back to whatever university you've sponsored your study because you can't afford to. It's just too expensive. 
when you bring the cost of all that technology down, the number of data points in a study goes up because the same money buys more sensors. But also, you will put them in situations you wouldn't necessarily put something that cost what the existing entrance in the market cost. Yeah, yeah, then and, and to go to go back to that space example too, it does seem like um, the modern space industry is like putting instead of one huge. Five hundred million dollar satellite. They're putting up a bunch of tiny ones, which are still, you know, millions of dollars, but and more expensive to get there. But a couple fall out of the sky. Eh, as long as they don't hit anyone, a big deal. <laughs> totally. Yeah, and that I mean, that's the thing. Yeah, Bradley totally hit it. Is like, um, you, when when tools cost that much, you only get one, and that just doesn't give you really good data to understand what's happening. You know, right? Like, you want more sensors. You want to see things happen over time. Um, the last thing I'll add that was a major frustration for people that we were working with. Um, that we're trying to solve with FieldKit is, you know, if you want to measure more than one thing, that becomes very difficult. So if you want a weather station and at the same time you want to measure water quality, like the way that that has been done in the past is you put up a weather station and then you manually measure water quality and you come back and then you try and correlate all that stuff together. Or if you're a little bit technically inclined, you, you try and create some sort of interface that brings that data together. But that's like, you know, then you're dealing with two different clocks on two different systems, two different connector types and languages and all this sort of stuff. It's just chaos. And so um, we're trying with FieldKit, we're trying to kind of standardize the way it takes to connect all these things together and really solve that issue that, um, that they see. Okay. Yeah, we heard from somebody, I remember when I was out, it was actually after the last super conference, we had a, a scientist and I won't, uh, you know, I won't name drop, but they were there talking about how an entire year had been spent uh, with some poor, unfortunate graduate student just trying to time correlate the data from some expedition or another. Um, <laughs> that it had wow. come in in like six formats, not synchronized, so they had to keep track of offsets and trying to bring all of it together. Um, they did manage to do it. That had not always been the case historically, but it was just catastrophically time consuming and expensive just to get all of it in time. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, and it, and it does seem like, I mean, so we've already kind of, like I said, we've already framed up the fact that this is a very messy process. And so I'd imagine that just, it starts messy. You know, if you don't, it sounds like the traditional way of collecting data is just like maintaining rigor in within your, you know, personal habits and all of, you know, the scientists collect data collection, all that other stuff. And so it sounds like it's just kind of, we're marching towards just trying to get more and more standardized because that is what's been lacking. And so having more data points, like you mentioned, having more sensors in the field, having more time time data to correlate, and then having it sent back to a server, all this stuff is going to just give more more data points, right? That's all we. That's what we're really trying to get at. Also, open sourcing the technology, right? The, uh, yeah. That field is all proprietary systems that all have their proprietary, you know, ways they talk to things and all that sort of stuff. And so we're one of the things we're trying to do is, you know, everything we do is open source. So if you want to take FieldKit and do something with it, um, you can. Yeah, it's all on GitHub. So if any anybody listening uh, is curious, um, and we accept contributions, <laughs> send a pull request. I'm happy to look at your pull requests. That's right. Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> Well, let's talk about the hardware itself because we've, you know, we've mentioned FieldKit. We, so, the company's called Conservify. The project's called FieldKit. What is actually inside of FieldKit? Like, what is the basis of, of the FieldKit? FieldKit? I don't know. <laughs> a FieldKit. This is a, a debate kit, we've yes, had yeah, internally yeah. as well. About yeah. Right. Things. Right. <laughs> it's it's uh it, what it is at its core is it's just it's an environmental monitoring um, kind of sensor uh, platform. So. So that includes three main things. One is very kind of modular hardware that allows you to mix and match as you like. And we did that in a way so that you can add on new sensor capabilities and on new communication, uh, you know, module sort of capabilities and really adapt it to what your needs are. Um, and then, you know, Bradley and Jacob could talk a lot about that. This, the second piece is, um, is an app. And so kind of the idea behind the app was, um, these tools can be very hard to use for some people who aren't trained in like the, you know, to write code and all that sort of stuff. And so how do we create these sort of open source tools that allow people to very quickly become, uh, start, start studying and monitoring their environment. And so that's like, okay, that app allows you to change settings on the hardware. It allows you to kind of 
um, download data and do all that sort of stuff. But at the same time, like one of the main issues around using lower cost sensors or even the kind of citizen science field is, is scientists complain about the lack of metadata collected around these deployments. They don't see it as like real science. And so we built a deployment process into that app that guides you through all the right sort of data you're supposed to collect when you're doing one of these things. So if other people are looking at, you know, the your weather station that's in your backyard of Los Angeles, California, they can they can somewhat trust that data because there's there's like metadata and other sort of information associated with it. Um, and then the last piece, which I'll go through a little bit of demo on, is a data visualization platform uh, that we built that allows you to kind of you know manage projects and sensors and allow you to to manipulate the data and share that with people and do do all sorts of cool things. So yeah, it almost sounds like uh, so if someone wanted to just turn their their smartphone on and like use a localized temperature app, say your phone is able to capture temperature, it's a lot different from like being able to then change the settings on that temperature versus reading the settings from your computer after it's been uploaded to the web. That that kind of like just to piece that all together. Mm -hmm. um, and it does seem like, so you mentioned the modularity too. So let's talk about some of the stuff that's actually inside the box because you guys have a box now. Um, and when I first met you guys, I think you were working on the box. Uh, I think we were so... just talking about the box. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, so that's great. been... So we, did, we did, that's this right here that I'm holding up. This is our... We, we, we designed our own enclosure for uh, for field kit um, that kind of, sorry, I'll do that so you can see it. Um, mm, that houses yeah. everything and it's waterproof. And and even that's modular. Like we added this this um, bottom plate that you can change depending on what you want to bring in and out of out of your field kit system. Um, but that mm -hmm. houses the hardware that Bradley can talk more in more detail. So it seems like there's, there's different like uh, selection. So like, it's, it's a lot easier to get started. It seems like, cause there's a, there's a weather version, there's a water version, there's all these different versions, right? Yeah. The disadvantage of being modular is that uh, you can sort of drown uh, somebody who's interested in <laughs> buying your product right, with options. Right. So right. we did try and make some, some packages that make it a little more straightforward. But uh, when you open the box, uh, you're just, you're presented with essentially, you know, the, the core of the board and four places to put modules, which actually are what connect to sensors directly. So the, all the thinky bits are up here and the memory <laughs> and the radios and all that stuff. And then these are what you use to interface to different kinds of sensors. And so it's that the standard for those module boards is one that we hope that other people will adopt and that will grow the ecosystem out from where we're at and from the things that we're developing out into some of the fringier, weirder applications. Uh, and mm. I mean, that it's, it's weird, fringy applications all the way down because <laughs> every, everyone you talk to has some peculiar thing or another that they want to do that's you know, right. not, not a large enough project to be a product. Um, so we wanted to very carefully, very deliberately accommodate those kinds of situations where somebody does not have to start from scratch and design the world's 16 millionth data logger. Yeah. And Bradley, can you talk a little bit about what's like in on the core and the lower and all that stuff? Sure. So the system is fairly straightforward. It's essentially a data logger where you hope to have thought of all of the important stuff. So the mm -hmm. The thinky bits uh, come as a sandwich. Um, partly that's because of just density, and partly that's to put a lot of the stuff that you might conceivably uh, injure with your muddy fingers uh, on the inside of the sandwich rather than out mm. where you're apt to yeah, poke that's them. Smart. Um, that, I think that the term Jacob coined for that problem was swamp finger, uh, where you, <laughs> you know, you're, you're up a tree or you're reaching out of your boat with your soldering iron or whatever, and you're covered in muck, so... Right. Well, it does seem like there will be fewer, fewer, like you mentioned at the beginning, fewer uh, total soldering irons needed too. Because I'm, these I'm hoping to reduce together. the soldering iron in the field experiences down yeah. close to zero. Ideally. Right now, so. it's like go pull the next version out of the bag, make sure it just see if that plugs in and see if that works yeah. instead. This is one of the reasons why too the app is very important, just because is is yeah. the, mm. the 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 it's as few interaction physically as possible in when you're in the field is always a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, yeah, and confidence again, too. Likes, it feels like yeah. understanding that you that you see. You, so you see a thing there. You see it's plugged into the water or whatever it's doing. 
is it actually sending data to you? And then will it collect? Because right. you don't want to come back in six months and be like, oh yeah, we didn't turn it on. Yeah. <laughs> well, we've, I mean, done, like, we've done that it. before. That's the thing uh, that happens. Yeah. There is a there is this fear that you when you're in this when you're doing something like this and you're in the field and you're standing in three feet of swamp water and you're about to walk away and you're you, you glance back at it and you're like are you gathering data right now um, <laughs> that's that's one thing that app is very nice about because it's all buttoned up and you can still talk to it it's going to time out and shut down its network and just go on for the long haul eventually but it's nice to be able to to have that peace of mind when you're when you're actually you know, yeah. in the field yeah. Yeah, and I imagine, especially if you're working with scientists who are not like, they're not getting in there with like DMM leads and they're like, oh, I'll just right. check it again. Just just check that sure reference voltage not. one more time, you know, like, it's like, okay, yeah. yeah. Funny, funny anecdote. We were, we had a deployment in, I think it was in Botswana um, and somebody had installed some stations for us and they were, they were at Rockblock. They had Iridium modems oh, yeah. on them. And, um, and I could see after the after it was deployed we would get daily messages of like telemetry and stuff like that and one of those things was battery and i could see the battery it's just perfect linear line because the mm. solar panel was not plugged in oh to that wow particular station yeah so that'll, um it you know that'll... things happen but uh it's um it was a fun little you know look at that yeah no that's a great example <laughs> it's a great example of like seeing data knowing what's going on and still not being able to do anything about it right it's just <laughs> right. Like, oh, okay well yeah yeah, there's a lot. It just seems like there's there's an infinite number of things that could go wrong in these cases. So, so Bradley, the um the hardware that's that's on there too. So I mean, like, what is the what is the level of like what's on there? I mean, is it a uh, is it more like a cell super, phone? Is it more like an Arduino? What is it uh, kind of? It's more might... towards the Arduino end of the spectrum than the cell mm -hmm. phone, right? So we're not talking mm -hmm. about Linux on a chip here. We're very conscious about power consumption, which is one of the mm -hmm. reasons why that's the case. Mm -hmm. um, you're going for something uh, a little, little less intense than running a full bore operating system. Um, it is not yet the year of uh, Linux in the field kit enclosure, but uh, mm, that uh, that day is probably coming. So it's an ATSAMD 51. It's the biggest one they make because we have a lot of uh, various serial buses to manage. So that's uh, not a particularly surprising decision at this point. Again, you, you want to be standing in the path of other people's financial investments so that their money hits you in the face. Yep. And in this case, uh, I think I think SAMDs come from the auto industry, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's a heavy investment uh, happening there. And there's a bunch of NAND flash on it because uh, you mm. are unwise to trust uh, SD cards. <laughs> and uh, there's a whole bunch. Of, there's an RTC, obviously, and some of the other uh, essentials. But then... There's a that's whole a real-time clock for people with uh, without yeah. the acronym in their brain. So, yeah. and uh, a GPS and you know a Wi-Fi radio and the sort of things that you would expect. And then there's a whole uh, load of power management situations uh, mm. to deal with the fact that like you're going to connect a solar panel and you have to keep your battery topped off. And sometimes you have USB connected and sometimes you want to be plugged into power all the time. And so there are a lot of weird edge cases in the. The flow chart for the power management uh, situation is the, the most complicated one on the board. Mm -hmm. um, and then the part where the actual modules connect, there's not a whole lot of active circuitry there. There's a, you know, a couple of indicator LEDs, and there's an I2C multiplexer so that uh, modules can share address space without hitting each other. Right, because um, if you have two modules that have the same chip on it, you want to still make sure they can talk yeah, and back in fact, to the micro. and. Every module we have has at least one uh, chip that is shared among all of them on it because we uh, have an EEPROM on that that identifies the modules to the core. So like, that makes sense. It is, yeah. it is always at the same address. Um, it is not always the same chip. Like we use larger ones mm -hmm. than some of them because we have data handoff that happens sometimes where mm -hmm. there's a micro on a module that can dump some data in an EEPROM and then move it around or wants to get firmware updates. So like that's a, that's a handoff mm. that can happen in either direction. Most of them are real small, just enough to you know identify the thing and hold calibration data. But it's nice to have the flexibility. That's and great. we are migrating. We are migrating migrating away from having micros on module. Uh, yeah, mostly mm. for power reasons. Um, mm. Is is what it is. Um, okay. So, and what are, what are the levels we're talking about here? So, so you put something out in the field, right? What is the practical, you know, like size of a, a solar panel you'd want to have, and then like a battery as well. We specify a 10-watt solar panel, which is more than we need, but it gives us mm. a good 
it gives us good output in middling sunlight conditions, which is often a problem under canopy. Mm -hmm. um, so like you want to be able to pull your 500 milliamps uh, out of the situation for charging current for your battery, even when the sunlight isn't great. Um, yeah. And yeah, you don't want to miss important. a day cycle pretty much, right? You still yeah, want to get so, some some charge. So like that's, we we don't try and optimize necessarily for economy in the panel just because we want to you know squeeze everything out of every photon that we can get. And then the battery that's in the system is uh, about six amp hours. It's a, a one over three lithium ion battery running, you know, nominal four volts. Um, mm -hmm. Nothing terribly exotic. We're we're kind of lucky in that in the enclosure, you kind of need a lot of room uh, yeah. just to get around inside, as like you're dealing with cables and and the modularity aspect of it. Um, and so that kind of means there's the the battery size was not something we really had to compromise on. In fact, we could even put larger batteries in there. Um, yeah, that's and great. Depending on the scenario, like like Bradley was saying, there's there's a lot of a lot of questions about various power scenarios that people want. You know, like most well, there's pe people that don't want to charge them; they just want them to last as long as possible. You know, this kind ah, of ah, interesting. So, okay, yeah, yeah. Solutions for long duration no solar panel deployment are one of the things that's on our R and D list right now. Um, and exactly what very large battery systems for field kit look like um, is a question that's being. Uh, it's, it's actively on my whiteboard at the moment um, mm -hmm. yeah. because uh, once you start getting into lots and lots of cells, uh, then you find yourself building your own battery management systems and things get a little more complex. Then you're building a teeny tiny little Tesla power wall inside That's the right. kit. And that, That's right. that can get a little messy, but it's probably a direction that we'll have to go sooner or later. Um, right now, we're telling people to essentially use great big USB power banks, but there are complications with that because our current draw is so low that most of them just turn themselves off because they think you're a phantom draw if you can't if you can't tell like um we we don't benefit with having a, a customer base or a user base that has a very specific set of requirements That's right there's a yeah. lot of people who want to do a lot yeah. of uh wild things with field kit and we're trying our best to accommodate uh those i find myself answering a lot of questions with okay let's walk that back a little bit what are you uh, why are you asking that it's, there's uh -huh. a lot of that, uh, right, you right. Know, like, how long can this cable be? Well, it can be this long, but why do you want it to be really long? You know, there's yeah. a lot of those kinds of questions. Uh, mm. There's been a lot of that on Twitter this week. So, you <laughs> yeah. know, somebody will have a project in mind and they'll ask the narrowest possible question that gets at what they really want to do. And right. they're like, can, can data flow out to the modules? Like, well, yes, it's a bi-directional <laughs> bus. Data can flow out to the modules, but what are you doing over there? That's right. Yeah, yeah. That's right. But they're just starting with a good negotiating position, you know, like you ask for everything <laughs> and then you scale it back and say, I guess I'll just take data flowing in one direction. Fine, whatever. I love it. I love it because it, it shows that people's minds are just, you know, they see this thing and their imagination takes off and it's, yeah. uh, it's yeah. great. You know, it's a, it's a great, it's some of those conversations are really illuminating about, Oh wow. I didn't think about that scenario. So it's, it's cool. yeah. The first yeah. piece of field kit, compatible hardware coming to exist out in the world is a is a milestone I'm looking forward to. Yeah. That's, mm -hmm. uh, that, that's one for which there's a sort of virtual bottle of champagne on the shelf waiting for that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so that's that's someone you're saying, doing pull requests saying, hey, I made a module that's custom for my needs, but hey, it also happens to work with all your stuff because I've read all your documentations, things like that. Yeah, I mean, it wouldn't even have to be a pull request to anything we've got going on, just something happening out in the... Uh, in the system, you know, in the same way that like people make feathers and shields ah, and right. all that kind of stuff. I'm mm -hmm. looking forward to that. We've encouraged it as much as we can, and now it's just going to have to work its way to critical mass. Got it. Yeah. Uh, so, what is the level that you expect people to? I mean, so so that that's a that's a good lead into this. I mean, you expect at some point people are going to build their own hardware here that that will plug into this ecosystem. What about the the level of firmware and like? programming so so i guess first off like how much so a scientist is like great i'm gonna buy a fuel kit how much is it just talks to an app how much is it they plugging in and writing their own firmware you know using an arduino ide or similar i have i, I this is a problem i think about a lot as a software uh person i my goal is is to take care i mean i think there's a lot of common scenarios uh with regard to sensors and what a module might look like for example it's really common to have a module that just has an adc on it um, and or or even just to generalize a little bit further, just a just a really common, you know, I squared C component that's on the board that's giving you some data, and I think that is 
one of the scenarios that initially, as far as the community goes, that we're, we're going to optimize for. Um, we've talked about creating, you know, sort of sort of a, a, a general purpose module with sort of pre-built configurations about what might be connected to that module that people are interested in. Um, you know the uh, you know because there's there's lots of kinds of sensor standards out there already. Um, you know you look at the the PLC world. What's what's the industrial the 420? What's the uh, 420 that? sensor? You mean like a yeah like a yeah, current sensor? Like stuff, yeah yeah. So there's things yeah, there's like Modbus that. Yeah, there's Modbus and things like that. Yeah, sure. Ethercat. Exactly. And I think so. I think that given given enough interest in those and enough sort of infrastructure around those kinds of sensors, it, we, it could be really easy for some scientists to say, hey, I'm looking at this sensor. And for us to either say, hey, it's already supported because right. it's, it's a standard, or it won't take us very long to, to write up the, the, the polling for that. Mm -hmm. And a lot of attention has been given to sort of the pipeline of data as it's, as it's exfiltrated from memory how to make it so that it's it's generalizable and viewable and that kind of thing and so uh it's very things very data handling is very consistent in that uh even the telemetry looks like data that's collected from sensors and so it's important that all our tools handle all that data all the way along and so um this is also especially complicated when we talk about calibration and that and that kind of thing oh sure is sure. knowing oh this was a calibration event so everything else after this has this calibration data applied to it and, and so on so um, we're hoping that as we learn our lessons with our modules, the the, the third party modules will benefit from that experience. Um, okay, so it sounds kind of like kind of sounds like the the expectation is most people are going to come in and use the things that are there to start with, but there's yeah. definitely capability to get your hands dirty, really dig under the hood, and and like and write your own code, build your own modules, kind of buy into the ecosystem, that kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and that first category of people will never see uh, an IDE, right? Like that, mm. the the stuff that's within our hardware ecosystem that we sell, yeah. you should never have to touch code to work with. Yeah. Got it. So they buy something like the Weatherfield kit that basically plugging things together, connecting with the app, Absolutely. and then yeah. saying, ding, 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 got it set up, ready to go. That kind of idea. Yeah. Mm. And and I do think, I mean, my goal is that if you want to, if you have your own module, um, or you're building on top of a general purpose module or something else that you need that the, you, you might find yourself in the Arduino IDE that you wouldn't have to know. It, you'd be presented with this sort of skeleton of an app that, that Arduino already kind of presents you with, where you have a setup mm -hmm. in a loop. Um, and a lot of our modules fit, fit into a very similar paradigm where there's very clear hooks. There is take reading. There is, are you healthy? You know, these right, kinds of things. Right. And, and given enough, you know, Given is given enough examples of this kind of thing um, and starting points where people this is like hey this is for this sensor it looks very similar to the one you they can fork the repo create mm -hmm. a new yep. sort of sensor firmware um, and be up and running. I mean because you guys have to feel pretty guilty about like getting rid of all the interns that had to set all this stuff up from scratch in the past. <laughs> you're like you're killing the intern jobs here, guys. Coming for your uh, jobs. Coming that's for right. Your jobs. Uh, sorry, there are science interns. You guys have to go take actual data and do. Yeah, the stuff you wanted get... to do from the beginning. Exactly. Yeah. Why, like why million... you got your PhD, right? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Like yeah, a million yeah. graduate students cried out at once and were suddenly silenced. <laughs> <laughs> from the hardware perspective, like the the trick of it, if you're trying to sort of shepherd someone through building a module, is giving them education on how not to be uh, bad citizens in the sort of hardware ecosystem, right? Because mm -hmm. like a lot of people who might be interested in something like that have never had to even take the sorts of measurements that you need to have in hand to not scrap your battery in four hours of operation. <laughs> it, mm -hmm. Like yeah. um, being, being a good citizen from the power perspective is a big deal. And some of these applications, like they'll be plugged in all the time and it won't matter, but a lot of applications they'll be running on battery. And the, the thing I expect sort of in advance of it having happened to be dealing with most is people who don't understand why they built a module and now their battery is just cratering um, because <laughs> it requires a lot of uh, fussy engineering as we've discovered to bring the power consumption down. Yeah, hmm. yeah, okay. Well, so it sounds like the the majority case, or, or at least the starting case, is going to be these people that are just interested in getting stuff out there. 
one thing that I, so I think about as a hardware person, I'm sure Bradley thinks as a hardware person, Jacob is a hardware dabbler now, software mostly, and Cha is a former, former hardware, uh, mechanical, right? You were a mechanical person before, right? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I did. A little, little bit of everything, it seems like. Propulsion, but, actually. I did propulsion yeah. stuff, so there's like there oh, got a little it. bit of got electrical it. robot. Hey, batteries can be propulsion too. I mean, like, you know, you just poke a <laughs> poke a hole in the back and it just goes the other way. Um, We're aware of that. Yeah. <laughs> so the hard part for me personally as a hardware person is that visualization piece so that that you've got data, you've pushed it. Maybe you're using Arduino, maybe you're using, you know, maybe you're just using GCC even, but now, okay, I got all this data. <laughs> Who cares? But the scientists really care, it seems like. So what does that look like now that it's been piped through the, through the app, right? And then up to the web? Is that the thought? Right. Um, stations have the ability to upload on their own. Um, mm -hmm. You know, one of the questions, one, the first question is always, wh what's your power situation like? And the next question is almost always, what kind of connectivity? You know, how, how, mm. how connected right. is how, the situation? How many cell towers do you have on the Serengeti? <laughs> right. Um, and um, and if there is, if there's Wi-Fi, you know, then you can configure the station to upload periodically. We have a station in the lab that's that's in an aquarium that uploads data every 20 minutes. Um, mm. And um, and so the app isn't totally necessary for that, but for the most part, it would be, uh, you know, the app is the conduit that the data gets up. And uh, Sean, I don't know if you want to show yeah. an example of the portal. Yeah, um, uh, I can. Um, uh, so we basically, one of the things before I go into showing it is, um, you know, a lot of projects in this space or even just science, science um, hardware that's being built, the place that a lot of people fall down is the software side of things, right? They spend a lot of effort on kind of the the shiny hardware bits uh and getting the shiny hard bits where bits to run and then they just figure okay you know once we gather all this data we'll just put it in excel or use something else yada 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 and, <laughs> yeah yeah and so we never so, want anything more than comma separated values right <laughs> yeah totally yeah and this is like when when we went and talked to our partners about field kit like we always told them like listen we want to build this in a way that's not it's not just that same problem that's happening over again. We're thinking about the full thing, like, you know, the, the, the start all the way to the finish. And that includes the, the data uh, platform. So I can actually pull up what that looks like here. Um, if you want to switch to, to streaming. Uh, can you guys see that now? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yeah. So basically we built this platform to have this kind of, uh, 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 every user will have this page or that page will have their products, projects at the top. Um, and then any kind of open community projects. We're also adding um, this functionality called collections that allows you to compare data even without having a field kit. So it allows people to kind of explore the open data um, as they want. And so if you look, your projects are here and the different stations that you have here. So if we, we look, for example, um, at this demo project, um, it it uh, allows Shaka, you, can you. Could you try and z zoom in a little bit on that? I mean, just maybe just a little Control Plus or, yeah, or uh, Control Scrolly. I can talk a little bit uh, about the, the data handling. Yes. Yeah, it's a little yep. better. Yep. Um, we so the there's a consistent format. So we store. It came up earlier. We're not a huge fan of storing data primarily on SD card. Um, we mm. backup data to the SD card, and the SD card is used for logs and uh, various housekeeping things, um, but primarily the flash memory on the, the hardware is where the data gets stored, as well as uh, the configuration, we call it the, the, that metadata we were talking about. So any sort of mm -hmm. configuration change event, any calibration event uh, gets logged, gets gets serialized to that log. And then the, the app will download them and then it uploads them directly to the server. And right. that's a, it's a pretty, the format is, uh, we use Google protocol buffers for that. Um, mm. it's, uh, it's a binary format and, uh, and so that's definitely something that's evolved over time. This is this is a file format that has to support lots of different scenarios when it comes to the modules yeah. and the data coming out the devices, so that the the portal can do do its job, which is showing it to the user uh, right. without it's losing like, you, anything. It seems like you guys are almost like a, like I always I always love the term sneaker net. You know, like that's yeah. like the instead of like an internet, it's a sneaker net. It's almost like you guys have to operate like that from the beginning. So you have to think like someone's going to be plugging into this thing, doing a huge data download and then upload it later. And so you need to be able to capture all that that chunk of, you know, 3 months or whatever the whatever the the timeline might be and then be able to like process that and understand that oh no this is three this isn't like 40,000 data points in one day. This is 40,000 over 3 months, that kind of thing. Right. Exactly. And I'm glad you used the the term sneaker net cuz that's another thing where 
we have to think about offline much more often than I think other yeah. people developing at least apps have to. Um, mm -hmm. I think if you're in the hardware space sort of offline, like what does that even necessarily mean? But um, but yeah, for us, like the app, everything has to work very much like I'm standing in water and there is no, I have no connectivity. Um, and so it is very much like, okay, we have to think about the app in two different scenarios. Like this is offline, this is online um, mm -hmm. and so on, yeah. Great. That's true of the hardware as well. Because yeah. like yeah. you have to deal with firmware upgrades and all of the things right. that any Internet of Things device has to deal with, but you don't have the internet. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. So like it's true. you have to consider what the ramifications for that are from yeah. just the architecture standpoint. Yeah, and um I, I can walk through kind of what it looks like. So if you have a project page, you have a lot of the information, you can have a team team members. Um, and all the details behind the project. And then all your stations will show up right here. So um, one thing that we do with the stations is you can name your stations. Uh, if you don't name it, it generates a name. Um, and it's usually an animal with some sort of uh, adjective. And, and so, um, you know, this this one is Rural Impala 30 um, is the name of the station. And if you In were the middle to of the city, it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, yeah, if you were to click it, it shows you information like, you know, the what the station looks like at that moment. Um, if you if you mm -hmm. step a picture and upload it, kind of the details around it and where it's at. Um, and if you click uh, explore data, then it loads in um, the like the data from from this. And so this is just a temperature sensor and it, it fluctuates because this thing has been carried around places and stuff like that. Um, but we built this so that you can actually compare uh, different data views um, between sensors and you can like you know, manipulate them individually or at the same time. Um, it also allows you to kind of, uh, you know, zoom in on data. So if I were to zoom in on this data and like, oh, this this view looks interesting and I just write, you know, uh, interesting here, right? Uh, then, the, and, and post it, right? Um, the, the cool thing about it is, you know, if you were to kind of zoom back out uh, to the full view, this this data, this comment is tied to that one specific data view. And so, the, the idea behind that was like, you know, you could have all these different charts where you're comparing different time uh, and, and like you structure this data view into what you want people to see it as. Um, and then that will generate its own kind of unique link that will be tied to the comments or you could just share it on social media or, you know, uh, make it a reference mm. in a paper or whatever you need to do. Um, but all that stuff's kind of captured here for, for anyone to see. Yeah, and we have, I mean, we have partners that are interested in, in... And one of the things that we've been very conscientious about in de designing the three big parts of of field kit is each one doesn't is each one can be taken and used on its own if mm. if somebody that if somebody sees the need to do that um i i don't anticipate many people want to use the app to talk to their own hardware but uh people are definitely interested in using the the portal for data that is not collected by field kit hardware yeah, yeah. um so so yeah, do you guys that, have like a publish publish format? So if someone's watching this or listening to this, could could they just match a similar format and be like, hey, I've got my own box here, but I want it to be able to show up next to next to a field kit box? Yeah, exactly. Um, they would have they would definitely have to reach out to me for some documentation uh, at this point. <laughs> I, um, Which is how I documentation wish, works. I mean, you got to talk to someone, you know, like send I, them a letter in the mail. <laughs> I wish there were more hours in the day. I really do. Yeah, uh, I know. But um. But we're doing what, the best we can right now. But yeah. um, it's no, nothing that says that's that's it's not possible. Yeah, it's totally possible. Yeah, cool. Is there is there thought like I mean, one thing that I think about is the um, is having some kind of actionable thing. So is it possible? So I don't. So again, to use that water level thing out in the Amazon. So it, it's it's at zero meters on day one, and day two it's twenty meters, and day three it's you know fifty meters. Is it like? Well, once we're past twenty-five meters, you know, send me a text message or some kind. Is there some kind of like capability of doing that as well? We, I mean, we talked about it. It's not something mm -hmm. we're we're doing a lot of yet, just because most mm -hmm. of the places these get deployed and there's no one there to listen. You know, if a tree falls, right? Because the they'd, they'd be under uh, they'd be underwater. Yeah, they'd be under right. Uh, or or you know, there's just no cell access, um, mm -hmm. which is one of the Got reasons it. why we we've, we've played with iridium as much as we have. But iridium mm -hmm. being as expensive as it is, that's very uh, expensive. Yeah, it's not something that's a priority. Um, I like the idea of Laura as like sort of an alert alert situation, but it's not functionality we built now. But it's mm. definitely something we've talked about building. Um, mm. 
and also I think that's a that's something that's a feature that sort of has to, to spread across every component. Um, you know, for example, if I come to a station and I sync data from the station, I might want to know. In fact, I'm definitely going to want to know if any of that data looked unusual, especially mm. if I'm standing in front of the station, because um, that's the, my one shot at making sure everything's still tip top and ready. In, in gathering data. Got it. So, so it's almost it's, more like yeah. diagnostic in that case than it is. That's not necessarily as much data collection as it is like data maintenance. It almost seems like. I, I think it. I think it's useful for both. I think people yeah. uh, are interested in significant events, and they're also interested in the kind of significant event that means that the hardware might be failing. You know, your probes right. might need to be cleaned or replaced or recalibrated. You know, that kind of thing. So it's. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, so, you know. I'll also add, you know, that that is a functionality that we've been people have requested um, already. Um, I, you know, I, I think that we're going to see how FieldKit grows um, going forward because up until, you know, last Friday, FieldKit was basically only available to people we were partnered with, uh, mm -hmm. and now it's available to to anyone. And so we've already had people reach out to us. We've had, you know. Uh, citizen scientists, uh, teachers, educators reach out to us, journalists, uh, hardware hackers, like, I, you know, I mean, data artists, like people who want to use this for art, sort of, I, all sorts of different stuff. And so, and there's, mm -hmm. there's also like, you know, commercial applications that would work with field kit, ag, uh, agriculture, fisheries, sort of monitoring sort of stuff. There's a lot there that um, people can use for other stuff. So I think we'll see as people buy it, what they end up using it for and how that drives um some of the features we we implement down the line yeah i think i even caught myself there thinking like oh that like 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 jacob was explaining like the the fact that it's offline you wouldn't need that that you know alert capability because it's not that sort of thing and so in that same vein i mean so people are doing the science they're they're charting this stuff what is so you've already kind of alluded to the the published in papers, but how else is the data getting used then at the end of the day? Well, I mean, it depends on, on what you're monitoring. There's a lot of places that will use it for, uh, for like, you know, policy around conservation decisions. So, you know, you can imagine you could put, uh, put water quality sensors somewhere. And if you start to de determine that the water quality is going down for some reason, that could be, you know, an industrial thing upstream that's causing that. Um, there's there's areas where people want to put sensors to monitor um, uh, kind of sensitive border areas between protected areas and non-protected areas, and maybe like that will help them change what that protected area ends up looking like. Um, and then there's also just like very kind of uh, you know uh, very specific sort of, of of government decisions that would be made with that sort of thing. So you know one of the projects that we're starting. Uh, this year is with the city of, of, of New York, and they're doing flood monitoring. They're going to use field kit for that sort of stuff. So that the data that's collected as a result of that flood monitoring is going to help them inform, like, you know, what kind of municipal operations they have. And and ultimately, you know, if, if we can bake in alerts and things like that, then, like, they can warn people that Gowanus Canal is going to say, or, yeah. you know, Gowanus has like his that. own Twitter account that just, yeah, like, says. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Yeah. Watch out. Here I come. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, that's great. That's great. So, I mean, soup it's to nuts, it seems also, like. Sorry, there's also like, um, there's other, there's other applications that we have a lot of interest in. So there's like environmental justice sort of stuff. So we're bringing out um, the next kind of big chunk of modules we're developing are the air quality modules. And there's a huge amount of interest for that. So, you know, there, you know, a lot of, you can imagine air quality is something that people are probably not going to be running solar pa panel powered, right? They can plug it into um, into a wall outside of their house and monitor their quality that's right outside of their house, right? That's something that they'll care about. So um, that might change the way that, that people are interacting with field kit as well. Some fun hardware challenges with air quality, huh, Bradley? Yeah, I mean, it depends on exactly what you're talking about. Monitoring particulates is easy. Um, that's There's lots of... Again, you're you're in the path of other people's money when you're monitoring particulates. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It's a little more fussy when you start looking at measuring contents of specific gases. Um, mm -hmm. There are lots of sensors for that application, but most of them require throwing like a watt at a <laughs> heater right. gotta first. Got to keep that resistor have, going. Yeah. Before yeah. you get a number. And so yeah. 
frequently at voltages that aren't really available in the system. So now you have a boost supply somewhere to give a dumb resistor a watt of five volts just to, right. you know, make it all right. go. So like there, there are some, there's some fussy business uh, from the power perspective involved in, uh, in the AQ stuff. But I mean, mm -hmm. we're going to, we're, this is not the last time we're going to hit those kinds of, you know, roadblocks. Mm -hmm. Like I, I expect that there'll be a lot of, it's always power, right? <laughs> like every yeah. time somebody asks, can I hook an X, Y, or Z to field kit? Like there's always the same replayed recording in the back of my head that says, that's going to just tank the battery. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like we had, yeah. you know, somebody the other day asking about Geiger counters. I'm like, you Ugh. can for 200 a while. volts on a, on a tube. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that, that sort of thing, that's forever the challenge in those sorts of deployed mm -hmm. situations. And if you're in a situation where you can plug it in all the time, then great. And I suspect more air quality uh, customers. Yeah, urban urban environments and yeah, and where they can be right. monitoring all the time. Like the the air quality in the Okavanga Delta is not a thing that uh, anybody <laughs> is like seriously concerned about right now because there's just not not uh, so many sources for those kinds yeah. of problems. But in the urban environment, like everything is different. Your connectivity mm -hmm. options are different. Your power options are different. Like solar frequently doesn't work anymore because all of the architecture is vertical. So you get like an hour and a half of sun over light a day. Um, so if you can't be plugged into something, well, now you have a problem that you only really ever had under canopy in the wild. So like as those sorts of urban centric uh, sensors start coming online and people start testing, I think we'll, we'll undoubtedly learn a lot about uh, how good our assumptions are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. I, I was surprised when I first learned about uh, VOC sensors, uh, volatile organic compounds. I, I didn't realize a lot of those were actually driven from the uh, from the FEMA trailers after uh, after Hurricane Katrina, and like there was a bunch of formaldehyde in there. It was, uh, it's like one of those like weird. It's that's why there's a lot of them out there, but also it's like yeah. a bad it's a bad thing and that led to a prevalence of sensors. And it's also why a lot of them are so narrowly tailored that they're frequently not useful for our use case. Like VOCs yeah. are a thing that interests us to check for, but 99.0% yeah. of the VOC sensors that are made for that purpose use math in them to interpret the results that they're seeing that assumes you're indoors. That's right. Um, yeah. And so it's, it's extrapolating things like CO2 from other things that it's seeing, assuming an indoor environment, and you stick it out, you know, under a Stevenson screen in a city somewhere or in the countryside somewhere, and the numbers you're getting are complete garbage. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Yeah. It's a, uh, that uh, real world hits the, hits the electronic world is, uh, that is an interesting interface to say the least. Uh, so, I mean, so I've showed the, the field kit site, what, uh, what do people have to do to start getting hands on for one of these things? Like how soon, how soon are they, are they being delivered? How soon are they, uh, are we going to start seeing them on the, the city blocks here in Chicago yeah. or, yeah, you well, know, or so elsewhere? We, yeah, we, we, we actually, so we, we were planning on launching field kit last year, um, and got hit hard by the COVID train, right. Just in terms mm -hmm. of like parts availability and all the things that other people had seen when it came to that. So what we what we ended up actually we wanted our our initial plan was to launch um, on Earth Day of 2020 because Earth Day of 2020 was the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. Um, mm. And you know if you remember last April, like that was just the thick of like all the uncertainty and fear around COVID, and so we decided let's hold off and figure out where we are first before we launch, but. To make up for that, what we're going to do is we're going to do a giveaway of 50 field kit stations to what we think are the are the neatest projects um, out there. So, so like we put out this call, we had a couple hundred, I think like 300 people apply to it um, with their just projects all over the world. Really amazing stuff. And we picked our favorite 50. Um, and so we're shipping those out right now. Those 50 projects. They're across 24 different countries. So FieldKit will be operating in 24 countries very shortly. And um, and they're going to be kind of collecting interesting data. Some of them are conservation organizations. Some of them are teachers. Some of them are, uh, you know, just armchair scientists. It's like all over the board um, there. Um, so we have those ones going out first. Right now, we're also open. The shop, FieldKit shop's open for pre-sale. So people can go and buy field kits if they want. And... Um, and we're manufacturing at the moment and we'll be kind of um, shipping those out shortly. So 
it's it's i mean it's ready for people to use um i'll I'll put a little bit of caveat there you know it is an open source project we are you know we put a little we put a smaller margin than i think a, a regular commercial company would be because we're we're open source and uh, and nonprofit and trying to like create a tool that's beneficial towards a lot of people um um, so, so we are trying to sell them and that, that those sales are trying to run the nonprofit. That's the structure that we're trying to, to, uh, to make for field kit moving forward into the future. Great. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. One of the tricky uh, well, things about our positioning in the market is that they're all good causes. So like <clears throat> everyone wants to come to you and say, you know, oh, I'm, I'm doing this thing and I'm looking for, you know, hardware for free or, you know, this uh, or that kind of support for my great, you know, yeah, humanity centered, uh, fantastic project, and you you have to you have to balance that against the fact that almost all of our customers are in that position, right? Like there's yeah. there, there's nobody uh, wanting Field Kit to explore for oil, right? Like they all <laughs> they, they all want Field Kit to do good stuff, and so mm -hmm. we try and for that reason we try and keep the prices out of the sort of heights that you would expect in a you know if you were the unmentionable company that currently dominates that space, uh, who, who mm. shall not be named. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's tough, right? You want to, you want to you wanna be able to offer the actual capability, but even, I mean, like looking at the, the cost is like, it's a, it's a high cost, right? It's not like going to be a Christmas present for, for someone, but it's, but it's a piece of technical equipment that could very much change the outcome of a community or a science experiment or, or similar. And if you compare that number to the number from the competitor, like there are digits missing. <laughs> True. Yeah. 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 And, and, and um, that, I mean, I think Bradley made a good point. We, the experience we got out of that, the, that field kit 50 giveaway was, was really great. And, um, and I think that it, like provides us with a lot of insight. So one of the things I'm going to do, I'm doing as like, um, as kind of the, the person who tries to, to find the funding for the nonprofit is I'm speaking to other foundations and saying, Hey, can you help us like fund field kits for, these sectors, right? Like, it, mm -hmm. like, let's do one of the things that we've been talking about is, um, is making field kits available to libraries as like a lending tool. So like, so oh. public libraries can actually lend out a weather station to someone for a month or something like that. And they could use that for educational purposes or water quality sort of stuff. And so we're, we're actually developing the program right now and we're working with a couple of libraries to start. But I think that like, that would be something that like maybe a philanthropic organization would love to say, oh, we do a lot of work in the library space and we will fund this so you guys can go and 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 you know build your build your hardware at cost and, and kind of put it into these sorts of uh these sorts of environments you just got to rebrand the project box to be like in a book you know like yeah. a big, big <laughs> shape have it flip open it's pretty Boom. close yeah. already yeah. Yeah. yeah right exactly it's got the hinge so you know you yeah. just need big binding so yeah uh, and what what does better in nature than a book yeah <laughs> <laughs> Well, guys, this is really great. Where can people uh, find out more about you all individually and then find out more about Field Kit and Conservify? Yeah, um, uh, we're all on Twitter and, and Instagram, but the Field Kit, not all of us are. Uh, the, Field nope. Kit, um, <laughs> the, the Field Kit accounts on Twitter and Instagram are Field Kit Org. Uh, but if you go to fieldkit.org, you can find all that information. I think first, if anyone's interested in Field Kit, go to fieldkit.org. Uh, there's mm -hmm. a lot, there's like, blog posts there there's the product pages the product guides a lot of that sort of information and we actually You'll see jacob all over the world soldering and hanging off will. things and <laughs> you yeah. should make like a count like a flip calendar I, of like jacob hanging off things I, <laughs> I i'm one of the things i'm really excited about uh as more people start to get their hands on these things is more pi is pictures of more people using them uh and there not just yeah. jacob you know, yeah. there's so many right, Jacob right. pictures. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and 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 we um there there there's a lot of like you know we moved a lot of the blog posts from our ha our hackaday.io page because um we we did a lot of stuff. Field Kit in 2019 won the Hackaday Prize, which is like a really exciting thing for our team. Yeah, and I mean Amazing. Jacob and I met both of you through Hackaday, right? Like basically, and and wow. both of you have like have um have helped us in, in ways um and we hired bradley basically at hackaday so um so yeah i mean i think that you know that's a community that we're really interested in um uh we have very strong ties to that community as well so we'll be doing some stuff there's some stuff that um I, I, that we have with planned with hackaday um 
over the next like year or two that um, I don't think I'm allowed to talk about yet, but you'll see us there as well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Well, guys, thanks for coming and talking about this. I, I'm really excited to see the future of citizen science and, and the future field kit uh, modules and, and just seeing these boxes all over every scientific study in the, in the, in the world. I want to see a field kit box in there. So yeah. th thanks for joining us here today. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, thank you. So that's our show with the uh, Conservify engineering team. I really appreciate them coming on and talking about the field kit. It's a really exciting piece of hardware for a couple of reasons. One is it's going to enable scientists to have better data and have a better monitoring of the environment, which is obviously under duress from climate change and poaching and just all of the factors that human-based influence is having on the environment. And we need to learn to live in harmony with, with the environment, I believe. The system itself, FieldKit, is really interesting for a couple of reasons. One is it's modular, like we talked about. You can swap out all those different elements. Also, the open source design initiative there, the fact that you can go and download that, you can see all the plans, you can participate, you can build your own modules to plug into it. Uh, I recommend you do that. We'll have links down in the show notes. And then the third one is one we, I don't think have talked about on the podcast much. We talked about it a little bit in the course before, but dealing with harsh environments is its own kind of area of expertise. You know, the idea that they have this specialized case, the idea that they're conformal coding boards and working to have really reliable electronics is kind of its own area of study. So uh, I think all of those things make for a really interesting product that they're going to be selling. And like I said, scientists are going to be using. If you'd like, you can go and support this show. Uh, please give us reviews on the Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, all of the different places where you get your podcasts. We'd love reviews. We'd love to directly hear from you. You can always email podcast at contextualelectronics.com. And uh, please share it. You can send the YouTube link. There's a YouTube video. If you don't know, if you're listening to just an audio, there is a video element. We did talk a little bit about the visual element. Or if you're watching the video, you can always just listen to this on the go. There is a podcast in all of the aforementioned places. So please do that. That's all for now. Thanks for listening and thanks for watching to the Contextual Electronics Podcast. We'll see you in the next one.